Greetings. Now we are still in the in the evolutionary ethical thing. By the way, when I was a young professor, beginning to teach at the, at the famous or notorious whatever you think Amherst College, I was uh, told uh, by people when I put up a course called Buddhist Ethics. I was told by colleagues, you can't do Buddhist Ethics because Buddhists don't have ethics. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, that doesn't mean Buddhists don't do good things, maybe. But the ethics means that you yourself want to do sinful things and you restrain it. And, uh, and then they're ethical. So ethics is a kind of restraint of your own natural negativity of yourself. And, and Buddhists don't have a self, they think. And so therefore there's nothing to restrain. They just do whatever they feel like doing. And I said, give me a break. And, uh, and uh, after a while, they had to agree with me that definitely they are very focused on ethics. In fact, that's one of the Buddha's major things is getting people to be ethical. Remember, he would have been a king and a warrior in a culture where kings had divine right. And they could kill, actually, as uh, legally, you know, if there was someone doing something wrong, because they were enforcing the rules of the society. And they had divine right of kings. And yet he said that killing is bad, and there, and there is no divine right of kings. Uh, uh, you know, a king should not kill, and he refused to be the king, actually, and so on. So ethics is a major, major thing. So now when ethics comes down to the ground for people in a particular life, in a particular society, People do have to choose a livelihood, a way of living, a way of contributing to the society that they live in, because we are social animals. So realistic livelihood is the next step in the path. It's the next arrow in the quiver. And so here it is. Once you achieve the realistic worldview and really feel the power of causality, you begin to consciously evolve. You become a conscious evolver. You understand the opportunity and danger of the precious human life, you, both opportunity and danger. You get determined about your realistic life purpose motivation. You then feel an existential drive to make your human lifetime count toward making positive evolutionary progress for yourself and others, especially those you love, and if you expand your sense of love toward everyone. First, you look upon all the others, in other words. First, you look upon the power of the word with awe and commit to always using realistic speech, taking up the educational life on all levels. That's right, I didn't mention that in recently, but you know, the purpose of life is education. Once a particular life is just one in a series of many lives, then what life, especially as a human, gives you the great opportunity to educate yourself to be able to have really positive future lives, that becomes really important. So the educational life, that is really what the Buddhist life is. You intensify your determination to learn everything you can, and you constantly astonish yourself with the fact that you can learn more and more limitlessly. I am 82, almost 83 years old, and I am delighted to report that I learn new things every day. I do. And I really enjoy l learning new things. I, I really do. And I, even there's even a thing. Only recently did it become accepted by neuroscientists that the brain has stem cells and that neural cells in the brain, new neural cells can be produced at any age. It's not just they stop being produced at 20, the brain, and then it just slowly deteriorates with scotch and soda every day. <laughs> More and more brain cells deteriorate until you die, which is what they thought before. But a woman scientist, a woman neuroscientist at Rockefeller University, she discovered, that, working with animals, that there are new neural circuits produced in the brain every day, and that those neural circuits increase the neural network, potentially. They don't inevitably do so, but they potentially do. And what is it that makes the neural network increase, she discovered, when the person or the animal learns something new? Then that new thing that they learn begins to help structure a new bunch of neural networks. So that if you learn more, the more you learn and the keep learning, the more your brain renews itself, actually. And that's then they finally, they fought her and said she was wrong and her experiment was wrong. 
and this was all bad. Some people associated with this one famous guy at Yale who wouldn't accept that at all. Must have been wrong research and everything in her lab. But finally, they were forced to accept it. And then when they did, they came up with the term, which is called neuroplasticity. And then wonderful Richie Davidson in Wisconsin Neuroscience Lab, he then proved also that people who become meditatively adept, and that's not only in just not thinking meditation, that's one kind, but in the thinking meditation, thinking more deeply and more analytically, penetratingly, and people who do that, they have greater degree of neuroplasticity. It improves your neuroplasticity. He proved that with neuroscientific experiments. So that's really, really wonderful. So that's educational life on all levels. And do you then understand more viscerally the nature of evolutionary skill and virtue and begin to shape all your physical, verbal, and mental actions toward the vast openness of enlightenment and away from being closed-minded at on any level, realizing that even your thoughts evolve, evolve you, they may cause you to evolve, you automatically become more mindful and meditative. You surprise yourself moment by moment with the increasing vividness of your experience. The final moment of this super education in living ethically is when you choose your calling or profession with the intention of maximizing your evolutionary progress. In Buddhist societies, such realistic living is close to the mainstream and the professional mendicant seeker is fully supported. There, the most realistic livelihood means becoming a renunciant mendicant monk or nun, and at least in your youth, in some Buddhist societies that want to have more population, they feel that it's better later, maybe, to produce and raise offspring. But in others, they feel it's better to refrain from doing that, and also, you, when you're young, you can learn better without having the burden of a family. So the mendicant, uh, which is the, the which Buddha founded and invented that mendicancy, monastic mendicancy. But in societies where production and service are the top priorities, there is no such support, and you must choose a livelihood that fits into society well enough, and yet optimally enables your quest for enlightenment. So in other words, you have adult education, let's say, or professional education. So therefore, you don't only go work nine to five or even worse, you know, business hours in some societies all day long, you know, in more slave-like societies. You don't only do that and then sort of watch TV after that and don't learn anything. But you, although you can learn a lot watching TV, but, uh, <clears throat> but the point is you keep learning even you're working, you know, that's very important. For example, to tell a bit about my own story, once my precious Geshe-la, Dengeleru Senemute, had read me Nagarjuna's friendly letter to the king, I got the Four Noble Truths as friendly facts. What I mean by that is I sense the nearness of nirvana combined with the hard work of removing the veils that prevented me from seeing it. As a result, I felt there was nothing for it but to become a mendicant monk. I already had been married as a young, at a young age and had a beautiful daughter, and upon having to leave that situation on my life quest, I had been living for almost two years as a penniless mendicant, but without the formal vow and professional commitment of a lifelong bhikshu or mendicant monk. My geshe understood my determination and acknowledged that I was indeed living like that already, celibate and penilessly dependent on the generosity of others supporting my quest. But he insisted that, in the long term, I would not be able to live like that, and so refused my urgings that he ordain me and initiate me as a monk. This went on for the nearly two years of my main tutelage with him, because I was desperate to be a monk, as he maintained that, and as he maintained that my food and lodging first at a neighboring Mongolian family's residence, and then in the monastery itself, were in compensation for my teaching English to the younger Tibetan monks residing there. <clears throat> Formally speaking, then, I was not being supported by the donations of the monastery's parishioners, since I wasn't a monk, and shouldn't be, he says, 
but was doing a job and receiving sustenance and teachings for that in a mutually beneficial and temporary arrangement. Toward the end, in a way, he was sort of saying, if you were, if you, if you were needing a life as a mendicant monk, you would have been born as a Tibetan, you know, or in a country where they had mendicant monks, but America doesn't have that. So, so therefore, you, you can't do that. You won't be able to do that. Because there is no institution for you. Uh, since you, human, an individual has to be in, interconnected with some sort of uh, um, institutional reality. Toward the end of that two-year period, in late 1964, Geshe Lama, exactly 60 years ago, that is, in the last wood dragon year, this, this year being wood dragon, Geshe Lama finally got tired of my nagging about being a monk, a professional mendicant, so he announced he would take me with him to India, where he was going, in order to help some elderly Mongolian monks who were stranded there, considered Russian citizens and not eligible for the refugee support the Indian government offered to Tibetan refugees. He told me, I will leave you there to further study with the Dalai Lama, and maybe he will make you a monk. In order to go with him, I had to find travel support and financial sustenance for daily living in India, which I was able to beg from my 94-year-old grandfather, who lived with my mother and elder brother by that time. When we got to India, the 29-year-old Dalai Lama agreed to monitor the studies of the 23-year-old me and eventually decide about my suitability for being a mendicant monk. Although he introduced me as a although Geshe-la introduced me as a sincere, smart, dedicated young seeker, the 63-year-old Geshe warned the young Dalai Lama, quote, this nice American boy is very devoted to the Dharma already and wants to learn as much as he can. He's very capable, though a little proud and crazy, uh, but he, and he really does want to be a monk. But I can assure your holiness that he will not be able to stay as a monk for the long term because he's an American. Nevertheless, I brought him to you, and you are, after all, the Dalai Lama, so you decide although I don't recommend it, you decide. <laughs> he said, so then I was annoyed with him, and I said, yes, well, why are you, you said you brought me here and maybe he'd make me a monk, and then you were telling him not to do it. What is that? <clears throat> he said, well, I just have to, I just have to give my notice, he said. He's a Dalai Lama, he will decide. So his holiness noticed that I was already fluent in Tibetan, because I was by that time. I actually learned to speak in 10 weeks. It was kind of a miracle because I had previous life as a Tibetan, of course. So he agreed, I don't know as what, but I was one. So he agreed to take me under his wing with no further comment about becoming the becoming a monk thing. The next couple of years were a great period of learning and bonding with His Holiness, mainly through study arranged with his older, his older teachers, he and I engaging in mutual tutorials, trading Tibetan knowledge for a thumbnail tour in Tibetan of my smattering of high school and college learning. Finally, after a year and a half, his senior teacher, Kapche Ling Rinpoche, and he himself, agreed to ordain me as a novice and graduate me as a full-fledged mendicant bhikshu, or Gelong monk, as they call it in Tibetan, Gelong. As a, Gelong means a, one who raises their skill, raises their game, actually. <laughs> as I had already been living like one for three and a half years by that time. I was, o but without the formality. I was overjoyed and tried to keep every precept with strict observance while redoubling my effort at study and meditation. You could say I had formally found my realistic livelihood as a professional Dharma practitioner, I thought. <laughs> so I did, I was happy. But I was really annoying. I don't think I say that here. I was annoying to the Tibetans who have a culture of being monks. Although, not all of them, but some do, although because of the, of the exile and diaspora, of the, because of the invasion by the Chinese communists, they, many of the lamas who were, had been monks in Tibet then became lay people in India because they had to work or do something to survive, you know. So they had been leaving their monkhood. But on the other hand, in the Tibetan culture, if you become a monk, if you do so with a vow to stay that way for life. So then I was a Mr. Purist. 
And if they would eat a little after noon, or if they would do something a little bit, you know, like not exactly what monks are supposed to do, uh, nothing serious, but any little thing, I was just, I mean, there are 253 rules of what monks are supposed to do. And so I was sort of enforcing all of them. So I was a real pain in the neck. Except it was not realistic for me, as Gejala had predicted. For the next year, it was fine. The next months in Dharamsala were sublime, but then I had to leave due to visa issues. Returning to the American monastery of Gejala in late 1965, I started to have to function as a village priest, so to speak. My studies and meditations interrupted by community service in the form of teaching the children of the Mongolian Buddhist community in the neighborhood. Then some of my young peer American former classmates from here and there began to seek me out. Some of them were involved in the civil rights movement, some in Vietnam war protests, and so on. I tried to help everyone, but mainly I wanted free time to study for eventual geisha exams in the Indian monasteries and to meditate just for the sake of gaining higher realizations. I served the Tibetan government in exile by traveling with the Lama as translator, visiting in Argentina on a mission to establish a Tibetan settlement there, which mission failed for a number of reasons. After some time, I tried to extend my service to my own American community, living here and there with friends or at my family's place in New York. Ultimately, by the middle of 1966, I woke up to Geisha Law's practical wisdom. I really didn't fit in anywhere as an Anglo-American Buddhist mendicant without a monastery. In this present life, I was not a Tibetan. I was not a Mongolian. The members of those communities were happy with my interest and growing knowledge, but I was kind of exotic to them. I couldn't really fit as a Lama priest among them. I couldn't really serve them in that way, and so it seemed incongruous for them to support me as one of their ministers or priests. There was no Tibetan Buddhist society in Tibet, as the Chinese communist genocidal ethnocide in the Tibetan homeland was in full swing, desperately trying to prove, since the Chinese communists were desperately trying to prove, that Tibet was just a province of China, which in fact has never been the case. And my American peers thought of me as an oddity. I couldn't really help them, because subliminally or overtly, uh, they considered me a lost case, someone who couldn't manage life and was hiding out in some exotic lifestyle, and therefore lacking credibility. In those days, there were no real American Buddhist monasteries, and in any concrete sense, I had no realistic livelihood within the culture I had been born in. So I resigned my robes and sent a letter to His Holiness in India, but I received no reply, since his office in those days was not well organized as now, and even possibly my letter was lost on the way. After a number of ups and downs, I finally realized that the closest thing to a monastery for learning was the university system. The only way I could continue my studies and practices lifelong in American Protestant ethic-oriented society was as a university teacher, where I could earn a livelihood by teaching others once I received the necessary professional training as a professor. So I returned to college after my six-year leave of absence. Actually, when I left in 1961, I wrote infinite instead of indefinite <laughs> leave of absence, then graduate school, then 50-plus years of further learning and teaching. Working out one's livelihood in Tibet, I said, what was a lot about myself, I'm sorry, but, but anyway, about livelihood. Working out one's livelihood in today's globalizing society. Obviously, since you know the codes for evolutionary skill now, right? No kill, no steal, no sexual uh, abuse, no lying, no uh, divisive speech, no harsh speech, no meaningless speech, and no mental... Uh, malice, no mental greed, and no mental unrealistic w ideas, fanatic ideas, absolutist ideas, open-mindedness. So those are the tenfold path, right? Just to remind you. So you know those codes. So the skillful and the unskillful, and you t save life, you know, and this kind of thing, you know, and uh, and and be, make uh, be open-minded and so on. 
so from save life to being open minded. So you do not choose to make a living by killing either directly or indirectly. This makes it difficult to enroll in a military profession, to take up food production jobs that involve killing animals, participate in media activities that incite violence by others or that glorify violence and killing, or even consume animal flesh as food or medicine, wear animal skins or furs, or use animal parts as ornaments. You don't want to engage in any business that enslaves people, binds them in some sort of servitude to your profit, that ruins their own positive use of their lifetimes, and you don't want to trade in intoxicants that damage their human intelligence and cause them to get into violence and harm themselves or others. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, I'm just saying. In our modern and complex societies, you also want, don't want to indirectly participate in killing, say, by owning stocks in war machinery companies, voting for aggressive leaders who pledge to destroy enemies, or supporting capital punishment regimes. You even have to be careful of your mind and not allow a secret thought of pleasure at someone else doing something harmful to others, since by vicariously participating in the harm, you get a neg negative evolutionary result. So that's a very important thing that, you know, when somebody else does something really good, you, there is a practice you do to be an antidote to jealousy where you mentally congratulate them and you feel delighted that they did a good thing. They had a success, they won something, they helped someone. You know, you don't feel begrudging about their virtue. And that, and that gives you a little of the virtue of them by mentally participating vicariously. Similarly, if you go to a film and you see a big robbery or something, you know, like those, uh, those robbery movies of all the clever movie stars robbing a casino or so, they always do rob some bad guys, but anyway, and then you feel happy they did the robbery and they got away with it, then that's bad because you get a little stealing karma when you do that. So that's, a, that's a, so that, you know, you, you, how you empathize with others is very important as part of your own karma, you know. So just on the first out of the ten levels of evolutionary skill or harm, it's obvious that it's impossible to avoid killing entirely as long as you are imprisoned in ordinary coarse physicality. Only a pure energy being can come close to avoiding all violence, a being that does not derive its life force from consuming other beings in any way, a being such as an advanced bodhisattva or perfect Buddha. Some of the immaterial dimensions gods, or greatly creative pure form realm energy gods, come close, but the long-term disembodied states of the former go along with an abandonment of the fates of others, and the huge cosmic whale-like presences of the latter are so huge that they take up energies that might otherwise sustain the lives of others. So neither divine, neither divine form enjoys the perfection of Buddhahood's clear light immersion in infinite, inexhaustible abundance. That's pretty hard for somebody ordinarily without understanding the Buddhist cosmos to quite understand, but it's very, it's important in a way because the first of the four friendly fun facts is to realize that any form of self-centered existence has a component of suffering so that you really turn your energy into overcoming self-centeredness. You turn inward and you want to, and you realize then you can have tremendous pleasure and happiness. But any form of, you know, even what you might think, oh, I'll be a king, I'll be a big star, I'll be famous, I'll be beautiful, I'll be this, I'll be that, I'll be a god. All of those forms are still have suffering involved in them. So that's, so then you realize that it's not so great to be this and that kind of god. Because you would then accumulate negative things without really even intending to, but you sort of do. And then, then you're going to have a hard time later. So the only goal worth pursuing is enlightenment where you're blissful all the time without causing any harm, and then you can do huge good for others. That's really, that's, that's why the first friendly fun fact is to recognize the, you know, the, the lack of pleasure, actually, to be a connoisseur of real happiness, and the kind of self selfish happiness is really, has always a bad result. So, however, Buddha's choice and that of his close mendicant male and female students was to minimize their destructiveness in ordinary reality by living on alms in, bount in the bounteous Indic economy and generous Indian culture. 
avoiding violence and forms of production that involve violence by hunting or plowing, for example. Although they, the Jains were more extreme about that. The Buddhists did farm. So that's why they had a much bigger community than the Jains. They allowed for agricultural production, even though some insects were, would get destroyed by that. The Jains had to do business in cities because they couldn't plow, because they were aware that they would kill insects when they plowed. So they were you know, stronger about their nonviolent vegetarianism and so on than the Buddhists were. Buddhists are a little more practical. The Buddhists argue that, you see, you, even when you digest vegetarian food, the microbiome has living beings. We are made up of a community of sentient beings, micro beings. And they, they die, and when we digest, they, they die and new ones get born, and they're constantly changing like that. So there's no way you can avoid some level of destructiveness as long as you're an ordinary coarse reality being. The mendicant lifestyle in societies with the necessary wealth and institutionalized generosity leaves the lightest footprint possible on the ecology of that community, that lifestyle does. The basic advice is that you should not be a killer, an assassin, an offensive soldier, an executioner, a weapon maker or dealer, a hunter, a butcher, a robber, a predatory business person, business person, a slave seller or owner, a pimp, a liquor maker or seller, a harmful drug pusher, a liar or false advertiser, etc., and that livelihoods that depend on these kinds of harmful acts are therefore to be avoided. In Buddhist medicine, the ethical livelihood of a person is counted as a positive or negative factor in maintaining or injuring a patient's health, since the human conscience, even if suppressed into being subliminal, has a powerful effect on their overall well-being or lack thereof. So in other words, if you're a healer to a person like a psychiatrist, you would look into even the subliminal ethical positioning and status of a person who was your client or patient. And you would realize that if, for example, they were a big owner of a nuclear weapon manufacturer and they were, their wealth was coming from that, this was eating at them and it would harm their health, actually. You, so you would analyze their whole life situation because we are so sensitive, we human beings, that, that uh, you know, even though it's something we put in our background, but if there is something negative about our lifestyle, it eats at us and it's bad for our health. In our material, uh, so therefore they have lifestyle medicine as well as dietary medicine, then as well as medical medicine, you know. In our materialist society where the power of the mind is routinely denied, because we don't even have a mind, really. We're just an epiphenomenon of the brain, right? It's just a brain. But in such a place, such a society like our present one, it is hard to imagine that a person's remote ownership of a war or meat industry's stocks would make a person evolutionarily liable for the destruction by the weapons made or the suffering of the animals slaughtered and would lead to a strong, though subliminal, current of discomfort and even mental depression in that person. But such is Buddhist psychology's claim, and a Buddhist therapist might well counsel someone suffering from depression to liquidate such ownership and such stock and invest only in positive enterprises as a way to cheer up, cheer themselves up personally, in addition to recommending drugs or lifestyle changes. So ethical change, ethical ethics are part of our health package, actually, if you will. Or ethics or unethics. So the next heading, livelihood in the light of the five principles of the politics of enlightenment. Oh, good. This, is, this, was, this was something that also I pioneered because people sort of think, because the Western people, when they encountered Buddhism, they thought all Buddhism just had to do with monks. And since most of those Western people were colonialists, they were mostly involved in... Uh, you know, colonial jobs, you know, out in the out in the management of India or Africa or someplace, Indonesia or something. And then they would encounter Buddhists in those places and they would think, well, these people are antisocial. They, they just thought, they say society is horrible, so we'll just leave. And then they, but then they, luckily, they were lucky to people would feed them and they would be monks or nuns. And so therefore, they don't, wouldn't have a theory of society. They wouldn't have a social science or political science, which is wrong. So I, I developed what I call the five principles of a Buddhist polity. 
which I'm now getting into because that relates to the right livelihood, a realistic livelihood. The fact that the ideal livelihood was to be a transcendent renunciant seeker did not prevent Buddhist science and super educations from dramatically influencing, even transforming the societies wherein they flourished. As a young scholar and teacher, I was constantly surprised that Americans and modern people in general had such a firm but mistaken idea that Buddhist institutions had no impact on the Asian societies in which they function. Look at the abundance of Buddhist art and literature, and especially at the rock-cut inscriptions of edicts left by the 3rd century BCE Emperor Ashoka on his famous memorial pillars all over India. I elaborated what I call the five principles of the politics of enlightenment as the framework for Buddhist social activism, which drove what I call the inner revolution that occurred to one degree or another everywhere Buddhism went. The five principles I discerned in Buddhist social ethical pronouncements, Emperor, Asho Emperor Ashoka's edicts, and the social advice given to kings in the writings of Nagarjuna, Aryadeva, Shantideva, and many others are, one, transcendent individualism. So this was shocking to people. It's actually shocking to me nowadays because people think, oh, Buddhists want to be unselfish and, and humble. How could they be individualistic? But actually, in a social sense, that makes you individualistic. Why do you want to be a, a mendicant? Because you want to attain enlightenment and you're willing to drop out of social production, which is family life, which involves social production of children, production of wealth, production of paying taxes, serving in military, serving in, in political institutions, and you, dro you, don't, you, you drop out from all of that because as an individual there's a higher thing you can do with your life, which is good for you. So in other words, becoming unselfish is selfishly successful. <laughs> so I, I'm the first person who noticed that paradox and made, therefore, this five principle, and the first being transcendent individualism. So I don't know if you know, if you, if you, maybe you may not be, some of you who I'm talking to may not be Star Trekkies, and they may not be Trekkies, which is too bad because Star Trek is a great teacher. It's a Dharma teacher, actually, Star Trek. That Roddenberry guy was a bodhisattva for sure, really. It was uh, sci-fi is in general great teaching usually, and and my point being that remember, uh, you have Spock, and you have Kirk with a kind of argument, or is it Spock and McCoy, between the, Kirk and McCoy kind of on the same side, and Spock is on the other side, and one of them is that all for one, and the other one is one for all. You know, in other words, the individual lives for the whole, and the other is that the whole lives for each individual. And sort of the American thing, I think of of, uh, of uh, Kirk and them, is everything is it for the individual. But Spock, with his kind of rationalism, is the individual must selflessly serve the whole. And these are they have this argument that goes on and on. So the point is that the Buddhism in that argument. And, and democracy, you know, for example, Winston Churchill said that democracy, democracy is the worst possible form of government ever devised, except for all the others. <laughs> which I love that one, and which is true, because why? Because democracy means that the people are more important and the people being more important means that each person is the goal of the society that they can have an optimal life. So it's which is kind of impossible. So it is the worst thing. In other words, the whole society is for the for the highest success of each individual in this society. And it's the opposite of collectivism, where nobody matters because everybody has to simply serve the collective, and they're all just pieces of a machine, you know, they don't even exist, which unfortunately is, is what, uh, that's actually the reality of a materialist society. You, you know, just be, be an unknown soldier and just kill yourself for the society because your life is nothing compared to the collective, right? Like we say that's what Marxism is about, but that's what actually we're about because why? Because we don't exist as individuals. We just, our brain exists as a biological robot. And it makes us think we're individuals with a soul and with a mind, 
But we're wrong. We don't have a mind and we don't have a soul. It's just the epiphenomenon of the brain. It's an illusion of, made by the brain. So we're actually totally collectivist, in fact. In materialist societies are inherently collectivist. So, uh, and supposedly rational, because we're just pieces of a machine, you know, which is a society. Whereas Buddhism, the whole point of human being is, human, the purpose of human life is to make a quantum leap in evolution to become an enlightened being. And therefore, education is the highest activity of a human being, learning the nature of life and how to be a greater being. That's what everyone should do. So in a way, everyone should be on full scholarship for life. And, and then, and actually, Buckminster Fuller even said so. And nobody even knows who he is nowadays. They forgot him. One of the great geniuses of the 20th century. He said, everybody should have a lifelong research and development fellowship. And if they want to go fishing, never mind. And they don't want to do anything productive, doesn't matter. Because if you do that, a number, a number of people, even if it's only a few, maybe a hundred out of a million, they will invent things that will make them, everyone else able to live without working. Because they'll invent marvelous, miraculous uh, scientific technologies and so forth. That's what he said. That's what Buckminster Fuller said. He was very against the idea of enslaving people in industrial, like, make work kind of thing. So that's transcendent individualism. It, it, it's an impossible thing, but it means that not just the, the society doesn't live for the king. You know? The king lives for the people. And his job is to make an optimal situ life situation for every single individual in the society. So ideally, they should all be taught how to be enlightened, and, and uh, they should be fed by machines or something. You know? uh, that's what, that would be ideal. But that's, of course, impossible. So it's a very complex thing. Where, but, but, but that is the principle, is the point. Second, so therefore nobody can be forced to serve the collective. Luckily, a person who fulfills their individualism becomes truly selfless and aware of that, wants to help everybody else, luckily. So in fact, that works out. But they do so happily and voluntarily because they fulfill themselves that way. As the Dalai Lama says, if you want to be successfully selfish, be a wise selfish and be compassionate and altruistic, and then you will be happy. And this is noted by modern psychologists. As I've said before, I think even in this series of commentaries on this book, uh, psychologists try to prove, the mainstream bunch, that there's no such thing as altruism, because the altruist feels good about being altruistic, so it makes them happier, so they have a selfish motive to be altruistic. And, uh, and that, therefore, there's no altruism. And I say, therefore, I'll, that's a bonus of altruism. That's why it's good to be altruistic. When you are less selfish, you are happier. So in other words, when you're less selfish, your selfish aims get more fulfilled. So this is, in the, in the political science, that's why a happy society is democratic, which me, happiness truly is democratic. We've been seeing the rise of democracy for thousands of years. That is the grand narrative of reality. The king with the divine right of king coercing everybody in a collective is a negative way of being. And especially male chauvinist king, you know, patriarchal. Then second, nonviolent activism. That's underneath transcendental individual. And why nonviolent? Because human life is so valuable. Because every individual human, even if they think they're uneducated or ignorant or even stupid, they can still become enlightened in the human life. It is a fantastic opportunity to take control of their evolution and avoid many future lives of suffering of different kinds. And therefore, no one's life should be just sacrificed to get some territory, to get, a, to get, a, to get, the, get the West Bank or get the East Bank. Or the, that's ridiculous. The human being should be there to study whatever they do, meditate, learn, instead of fighting each other over some field. That's ridiculous. Third principle, educationalism. The, I thought I invented, I did invent the word, but I found out another guy did it at the same time, was a Latin American guy, educationalismo in Spanish, was made by, I can't remember his name, he lives in Barcelona now, but he's from one of the Latin American countries, I think maybe Peru, I don't remember where he comes from, and I can't remember his name, but he's a, he's a well-known sort of 
leftist intellectual, and he invented the term educationalismo in Spanish, individ separately, which I was pleased to discover. Anyway, educationalism means that the highest purpose of a human life is to be educated and to continue learning and educating themselves all their life long. And, so, and the society r recognizes that as the highest occupation in that society. And the most honored occupation is teaching others. Learning oneself, of course, and then being able to effectively teach others. That's really good. Then the fourth one is social altruism. That, you know, there, nobody should starve to death. So it's like socialism. Uh, that, you know, that, uh, that the productive forces of a society are to support every, every human being, at least. And uh, therefore, altruism is the key uh, principle of society. And that is the case in democracy. Ideally, and fine uh, social democracy is the best. And five, monarchically sanctioned egalitarianism or democratism. And I did that because in ancient time, and this is very un impossible for us in Europe, because of our whole thing against the, in America, particularly because of the, the idiot Br British king. But in Asian history, a strong executive, in the form of a benevolent emperor was the one that was able to look to the transcendental individualism in a society. What was really bad would be robber barons, you know, who would have just a figurehead monarch, and then they would be competing with each other and enslaving their people and, and drafting them in their samurai uh, bands and so on, and causing a lot of violence in the society. And uh, so I put monarchically sanctioned egalitarianism. And um, this is the theory of imperial in, in China, for example. People wrongly think that an emperor is a dictator, but in theory, not. I mean, um, some of them have been, and those those emp empires have not lasted well. But the good ones have been where the emperor has a particular pronoun in the Ch classical Chinese, Chun, and no ordinary person uses that, because Chun means the humblest servant here. Because the being who lives trying to maximize every individual's benefit is the servant of everyone, actually. That's what the best leader is. And, and that is a theory in Asian, Asian uh, history. And uh, very, no, very, very, very often not observed, but it is a theory. So today we can just go for democracy. Never mind. We don't want any monarchs well, unless, unless they really support democracy. We don't want them. The first of these five... So those are the five principles of the politics of enlightenment, as I call it. The first of these five, individualism, comes from the insight that each individual is born alone, except for a possible twin, and dies alone. And the effects of how she or he lives their life are experienced by her or him alone in future lives. Of course, they are born with their mom and dad, especially mom, definitely. But the point is that they're ultimately they you know they have to make their way you know L but luckily humans because the being is so helpless for so long they become social animals that's why and because they value compassion we humans do each, each each human individual also has the rare opportunity to fully understand the processes of birth and death and transcend them into the reality of nirvana and buddhahood so as to free him or herself from suffering and so become truly able to help free others to do the same. The second of these, nonviolence, naturally flows from this principle, since any human life is so valuable to the individual who has it, given the evolution transcending opportunity to achieve freedom and fulfillment. And this nonviolence should be activists working nonviolently to put an end to the various violent preoccupations and activities of uneducated societies and individuals. The workings of this process have been hard for historians to notice, since the more nonviolent a society becomes, the more vulnerable it has become to neighboring societies still addicted to the usually poorly educated but highly trained violent conquest activities. It also becomes a more tempting target because its people become much happier and wealthier and its lifestyle and infrastructure more beautiful. Its women tend to become more free to demand gentleness and common sense from its less violence-oriented males. Hence, such advanced societies have tended to disappear from historians' sight by being invaded and dominated by less advanced peoples. Witness the history of colonialism. The third principle, educationalism, requires making up a new word 
for the social principle that the best thing for a human being to do is to learn to be a greater human being. I later discovered to my delight that this word exists in Spanish and Portuguese with both good and bad connotations as educacionalismo. educacionalismo. Along with education being the most important industry in a society, the purpose of human life is to learn in an endless progression that leads, believe it or not, to full omniscience. <clears throat> Buddha is omniscient, not omnipotent, and no god is omnipotent. But Buddha, more than the gods, is omniscient. And that's why they say one of the names of a Buddha is Deva Manushyanam Shastra, which means teacher of humans and gods. But he can, they consider humans the best disciples, however. Education culminates in super-education, rather than just higher education, a path of radical transformation of the individual into a being of love and compassion and universal responsibility for all others, i.e. a Buddha, fully awakened and enlightened, in, uh, and enlightened. In production and conquest-oriented societies, that is, greed-focused ones and violence-focused and anger-focused ones, Education is mainly training for a productive or aggressive occupation designed to aggrandize the wealth and territory and prestige of the society. The lifelong and future life-oriented education of individuals as the supreme purpose of the collective is the kind of paradoxical principle that is essential to democracy, humorously described by Churchill as the worst possible system of governance except for all the others. The fourth principle, social altruism, simply means that the society holds the lives of its individual members as sacred, another seemingly paradoxical yet obviously necessary element of any true civilization. Luckily, when any individual, you know, imagine today, Russia and Ukraine, uh, Hamas and, and, uh, and uh, Palestine and Israel, um, China and Tibet, China and the Uyghurs, Mongolia and China, I mean, how many of these situations? America and the native people here, and et cetera. There's so many of these situations. Well, imagine if for some, in some reason, for some way, the thou shalt not kill commandment in all the Christian countries, which is also in Islam and also in Judaism, that commandment was taken as a political po policy by all governments. So then any time there was conflict and controversy, negotiation and dialogue was, was the absolute only recourse that they would have. Then they would have to sit down and argue it out. They would have to have judges. They would have to have reasoning. They would learn lawyerly skills. And they would have to fight it out with words. And, and everything could be solved easily. <laughs> We're smart. We're all smart. There's plenty of land on the planet. That's much unused land, actually. It's ridiculous, this business. Destroying everything. It's crazy. Nobody can... You know, somebody said... I uh, This one historian and political scientist, I have a bet out with him, and he's sure that Russia is going to win in Ukraine. And, of course, that's completely stupid. He's completely mistaken. But then, but then he, one of his proofs, you know, when we argued at a dinner, in a cordial manner, because we have a bottle of wine bet on it, but in a cordial manner. But one of the proofs was they already have 20% of the territory. And I said, they don't have any ter territory. What they did is they reduced the territory to rubble. And they, they could, they maybe, if they were decently accepted by other people as being worthy people, which they aren't, they were alienated everybody else by that behavior, they could maybe get somebody to invest in rebuilding it, yes, but they, but they have got nothing. They just destroyed everything and destroyed themselves in the process, but he wouldn't agree with that. So we have a bottle of wine bet on it. <laughs> Imagine if they were working together to make the Russian people happier. So they wouldn't have to come to Ukraine to tell you to steal the ice boxes out of the village houses. They would have finally some ice boxes of their own. They never invested in their consumer activity, that, that oligarchy there. Not one penny. They have no, no infrastructure for the people. Just terrible. That's why they, you know, the ones who were stuck on those villages, they killed everybody and took their iceboxes and TV sets. <laughs> but ridiculous. Okay, so, uh, 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 uh.
yeah, simply means that the society holds the lives of its individual members as sacred, another seemingly paradoxical, obviously necessary element of any true civilization. Luckily, when any individual becomes super educated and thereby super happy, out of gratitude for that, they are courageous and willing to sacrifice themselves for others for the benefit of a society that values their individuality as supreme above all collective purpose. The fifth principle is monarchically sanctioned egalitarianism, which is that the transcendently individualistic democratic egalitarianism of such a gentle and nonviolent, super educationalist and generously socialistic society is best guaranteed by a single enlightened monarch or executive. This, like Tibet was. Tibet didn't have a warrior king. It had a monastic monk king who didn't have a dynasty to aggrandize and enrich himself and to, you know, after being the president for a while, then you get to be rich, like Mexico. All the wealthy families there are ex-president's family. That's where they get the wealth, by corruption. And, uh, and that's it. So, but if you have a monk, they have no, they're not allowed to own anything basically. So they are only there to serve people and to try to mediate conflict. In theory, not that it was always perfect. This preference for monarchy was of course necessary in the Buddhism influenced history of Asia. Though often ensconced within the restraints of councils of ministers or elders. But it may well be something to consider in modern times too as we have seen that the best social systems have been developed by strong executives even reflexively anti-socialistic America such as Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the New Deal, you know, and, and Biden's trying to do that now, and Mrs. Biden, because he's listening to Mrs. Biden, right? which he didn't do before when he was a senator. The modern forms of democracy seem to function reasonably well in societies with a symbolic monarch, such as England, Japan, the Netherlands, Scandinavian countries, and Thailand, but although not any longer in Thailand right now, where the monarchy can act as a restraint to the oligarchic factionalism that tends to corrupt parliamentary democracies. And that is true. The great thing about Buddha's teachings on realistic livelihood is that they were delivered in the context of the relatively civilized Indian culture. Therefore, he was able to interact for 45 years with a wide variety of persons and speak with them about how to cultivate a realistic livelihood since he had come to understand the deep nature of reality by means of his own reasoning ability and his experiential critical wisdom, he realized that others could realize it themselves. So he was able to dissociate himself from the religions of the time more strictly than other contemporary teachers could. Coming to a new understanding, I think that maybe, maybe we'll stop here. As it, uh, and uh, because we will, and we will come back to the end part of this chapter in the next time, because this is a really good thing, and th this is a, this is our right livelihood as requiring democracy and nonviolent activism requires you to vote and to learn about the good forms and bad forms of governance the good governors and the bad governors and only vote for the good ones. And basically the easy criterion for that is who is happy and who is unhappy. And you can tell who people, when people are angry and unhappy and violent, don't vote for them. If they're happy, even they may say there are some problems and they want to do something about them, but they themselves are happy. You can trust them. And so that's easy, actually. That makes it easy. You see everybody on television all the time, day and night. <laughs> and you can see who's angry. You can see it. Don't vote for the angry ones. You'll have a bad time if you do. Okay? So, Kewa di en yodu da, Jensen Janyan Trub Jone, to a Chinsan Malu Bandi Salakuru Show. By the virtue of this teaching and learning together that we did and reading this Wisdom is Bliss summary of Buddha's wonderful gifts to humanity uh, it's all in a, in a contemporary way to fit into our situation uh, may we quickly become enlightened ourselves and be not to lord it over anybody who we think is unenlightened, but to f help others find that enlightenment that they also have in themselves and reinforce that for them to make them happier and equal to us. And having discovered our ultimate equality to them, 
making them also equally happy as ourselves. That's our goal. Okay, thank you.